The industry is completely destroyed. It's 1983, and the American video game industry has collapsed due to a combination of factors. Oversaturation of consoles, competition with personal computers, and games like E.T. that was so unbelievably good, it intimidated would-be buyers that felt that they were unworthy to play such a masterpiece. A ton of employees are getting laid off, and plenty of game creators are shutting down. Atari, the king of the industry, is burying hundreds of thousands of unsold cartridges in the New Mexican desert. The crash is kept contained in the U.S., but it shocks foreign producers. In Japan, video game makers watch the American struggle from a distance. Two important companies are among them, Nintendo and Sega. Between these corporations, a rivalry is brewing that will set the stage for the modern gaming industry. On July 15, 1983, Nintendo releases the Famicom, a contraction of Family Computer. They're selling it for 14,800 yen. It launches with three games, Popeye, Donkey Kong, and Donkey Kong Jr. On the same exact day, Sega releases the SG-1000 at a price of 15,000 yen. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the recognizable titles that Famicom users can play, or any major titles for that matter. One good thing that Sega doesn't have, however, is a massive media conglomerate breaking down their door. Nintendo is actively being sued by Universal Pictures over Donkey Kong, which Universal claims is a copy of King Kong. Nintendo ends up winning the case in December. Kirby, the little pink guy, is named after John Kirby, one of the lawyers who defended Nintendo in the case. Nintendo's Famicom is by far the best-selling console in Japan, but Sega's still making a lot of money and is comfortably in second place. In 1984, Nintendo releases Duck Hunt for the Famicom. It's revolutionary, as it has a gun that the player can actually hold and shoot digital ducks with. In 1985, Sega releases Hang On, an arcade game where the player uses motorcycle handles as a controller. It's a massive hit. Nintendo releases a game about plumbing or something, and it's super popular. There aren't many formidable foes in the American market, except for maybe Atari, but they're still suffering from the financial equivalent of a broken femur after losing $536 million. The industry over there is completely shattered, and nobody seems to be able to fix it. If Nintendo wants to make a foothold in the United States, the time is now. That'll be hard, though. Americans don't have any trust in the video game industry after so many people bought E.T. for the modern equivalent of $130. Nintendo starts off small by releasing the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES for short, on October 18th in New York City. The NES is pretty much just a rebranded Famicom. To get around all of the distrust, Nintendo doesn't use the highly stigmatized term video game in their marketing. It's just an entertainment system. Also, they have a special little guy up their sleeve. You're a gamer, so obviously, you have no friends. <laughs> Here's Rob. He's a robot that'll play with you. Because you're a lo- It also shows retailers that both he and the NES are toys and not, you know, video game consoles. For sure. Two days later, on October 20th, Sega releases the Mark III in Japan. It does really well, but only by Sega's standards. That sounds kind of cruel of me to say, but Nintendo is still way- way ahead of Sega. They're catching up, though. In 1986, seeing their success in the New York test market, Nintendo begins to release the NES widely in the United States. Sega sees their success, rebrands Mark III as the Master System, and begins selling it in the US. The Master System doesn't have Duck Hunt, or Donkey Kong, or Super Mario Brothers, but it does have 3D glasses and Hang On, which is now one of the highest grossing games worldwide. Nintendo makes a new game called The Legend of Zelda this year, and it experiences success in the Japanese market. In 1987, Nintendo brings The Legend of Zelda to the United States, and they come out with Final Fantasy for their Japanese customers. In 1988, Sega releases their new console, the Mega Drive, in Japan. It has 16 whole bits! In 1989, they rebrand it as the Genesis and begin selling it in the United States. Unfortunately for Sega, Nintendo decides to begin selling the Game Boy, which pushes them even further ahead. The following year, Sega comes out with the Game Gear, their answer to the Game Boy, which has color. Despite that feature, the Game Boy still sells 10 times as many units. Nintendo dominates the American market with an 80% share in 1990. Poor little Sega is stuck with 15%. Nintendo releases the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, which also has 16 bits, but more importantly, they begin selling Final Fantasy in the United States. Sure, Super Mario Bros., Donkey Kong, Duck Hunt, The Legend of Zelda, and Final Fantasy may be cool, but you know what else is pretty rad? Sports. The Genesis has a new game called John Madden Football from an independent publisher named Electronic Arts. It is the first of the 784 Madden games that would follow. 
Sports are cool, but you know who else is cool? Michael Jackson, because he has a game on the Genesis as well called Moonwalker. Being super duper rad is going to be Sega's marketing strategy for the foreseeable future. If they want to gain market share, Sega has to show the world what makes their console better than Nintendo's, but what exactly can the Genesis do? Hmm... Well, you see, Genesis does what Nintendo don't. There we go, campaign slogan. They air these ads everywhere, consistently insulting Nintendo. In 1991, the SNES comes to the United States, but Sega's been cooking behind the scenes. They need to market the Genesis as being the cool console to own, yes, but they also need better titles. In response to the brutal reign of Mario, a hero arises. Sonic the Hedgehog. People love this guy, and he's a massive success. Sega's pushing Sonic hard and is investing millions in a campaign to tell Americans about how lame Nintendo is. The problem for Nintendo is, it's working! Really well, in fact. By 1993, Sega has 45% of the market, and Nintendo only has 44. Sega keeps putting out absolute bangers, with one of my favorite examples being a commercial where this kid gets bullied, buys a Genesis, and is now super duper cool reigning over his classmates and former bullies. Angles has a problem. He needs to earn the respect of his peers. So he gets Sega Genesis. While Nintendo is watching their dominance slip away due to Sega's peer pressure, Sega partners with MTV because what could be cooler to 90s teenagers? Sega puts on a competition in 1994 where contestants compete to quote unquote rock the rock. The Rock, of course referring to Alcatraz Prison, where the company hosts the event. They have winners from regional championships all over the world compete to get the highest score in Sonic and Knuckles, their new and never-before-seen game. It generates a lot of buzz, and the actual game is released in October. Sega then releases the Sega Saturn, a 32-bit console, in November. In December, a new enemy arrives. Sony's PlayStation. In 1995, Sega releases the Sega Saturn to the American market, and Sony does the same with the PlayStation. Sega's selling their console for $400 compared to Sony's price of $300. The Saturn pretty much flops. They aren't alone, though. Later that year, Nintendo comes out with the Virtual Boy, a virtual reality gaming system. The player sets the Virtual Boy on a table, leans into it, and plays on a controller. It has 32 bits and a color screen. Unfortunately, that color is red. Only red? I'm dead serious. Take a second to go look it up. The gameplay looks like it's from a creepypasta. Almost nobody buys the Virtual Boy. In 1996, Nintendo decides to skip a 32-bit console, ignore the Virtual Boy, and jump straight to 64 like absolute madmen. The Nintendo 64 does really well, but not as good as the PlayStation. They also release a really cute game about dogfighting on the Game Boy. In 1997, Sega records a loss of $327.8 million, a feat that was probably achieved with the help of the Saturn. In 1998, Sega records a loss of around $270 million. Not cool. Sega tries again with a new console and releases the Dreamcast in Japan and the United States the following year. To stay competitive, they slash prices and they end up losing an absurd amount of money. They record a loss of around $277 million in 1999, and the price slashes in the coming years don't work. Unfortunately for the coolest corporation on the block, this is the end of their participation in the console wars. They throw in the towel and don't release another console after the Dreamcast. It's probably for the best, though, because Nintendo starts making insane products like the Game Boy Advance and GameCube in 2001, the DS in 2004, and the Wii in 2006. In 2007, Nintendo and Sega put aside their historical differences and make a game together. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. They continue to make them to this day. I think I might end it here, because that's a pretty poetic ending. So, what can we learn from the original console rivalry? I think it's obvious. This era saw the births of some of the most beloved franchises in history, but not even these games can compete against the true GOAT. E.T. Thank you for watching. So, considering how this video covers a, uh, <coughs> sensitive topic, I'm kind of risking everything to make this video. So if you enjoyed, uh, a like or a sub would be nice.